Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. A few weeks ago, the State of Israel made a unilateral declaration that Jerusalem would be its capital. This declaration was supported by the United States and a few other countries of the world. The effect of this declaration is such that the Palestinians are left without a capital that they can call their own. Tonight on Tough Talk, to discuss this, the effect of this declaration, we are privileged to have our brother, Muhammad Abdullah, who is also the, chap the Muslim chaplain at the University of Nairobi. Brother Muhammad Abdullah, welcome to the show. Jazakallah khair. Now, most of the people have always been hearing about this issue for a very long time. Most of us grew up least hearing about Palestine and hearing about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But we do not have the historical background as to what Palestine is all about and to what its history is all about. Kindly, if you could share with us what is the history of Palestine. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal musalin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in wa man tabiyahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen amma ba'd Alhamdulillahi all the praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made it possible for us to be in this program and the history of Palestine is long it goes back from you can say during what they say, the period, the earlier Stone Age period, mm -hmm. which historians have estimated to be between 500,000 to 14,000 before Christ. That era, that era. And that era, during that era, there were people living there. And even before that era, we know that Nabi, Ibra Nabi Adam alayhi salam was the first person to build the Masjid al-Aqsa at the point it is now. Therefore, it is a period spanning even before that period. And then after that, there was the second period. The period, this uh, earlier Stone Age period was a period whereby there was a tribe, there was a community known as the Tatwaf, Natwaf community. Which, to use, which used to live in that area. And then after that also, during the second period, the period between 14,000 to 8,000, that was the second period whereby there were people who used to live in that era, in that area. And then there was a period of the Stone Age period, the late Stone Age period whereby a sense of stability was seen in Palestine. And the first town to be established, which is known as the oldest town to be established in this world, as the modern, just like the modern towns we have, was the, was the town known as Ariha. Ariha has been changed. You know, most of the names in Palestine have been changed from the earlier name to the Jewish names or the Zionist name. This is a town which has been renamed as Jericho. We have Jericho also in Nairobi, yes. but this is another Jericho which is known as uh, Ariha. And then after that, there was the copper period, uh, the copper or the brass age, yes. uh, which was between uh, 4,500 to 3,300 before the, uh, the Christian era. And during this period, the archaeological diggings and uh, excavations and uh, uh, its effects, uh, they say that there were towns which were built then, established then. For example, there is uh, an area which is known as Bir Sabah, turned to be Bir Sheba. 
There is uh, the Jabal of Al Khalil, or now it is Mount uh, he uh, Hebron. And then there is also uh, an area between Al Khalil, Hebron, and the Dead Sea, Al Bahr al Mait. And then, but the period which is unique to Palestine is the period between uh, 3,300 to uh, 3,200 to 2,000. And this is, the known, is known as the, the bronze, the earlier bronze age, whereby uh, it is a period whereby towns were fortified from external aggression against them. And there were very many towns which were established then. Uh, and uh, in this era or in this age, most of the town established were at the middle of Palestine and also the east of Palestine, eastern Palestine and the mid Palestine. And the major towns established then were like Bisan, Afula, Ras Nakura, Tal Al Faria, uh, which is west to Nablus. Nab Nablus is a major town in West Bank. And uh, after that, you find that development went on. Maybe bring us to speed uh, in this history that uh, we, uh, fro from then on, bring us to speed up to the up to era around uh, 1900, 1900. and beyond. 1900 and beyond. Yes. Okay, there's a period between 3,200 to, uh, to uh, 2,000, whereby there were four Arab tribes which went and, and immigrated to Palestine. Yes. The Amorites, Amalekites, Yebusites, the Phoenix, the Canaan, in fact, five, the Canaanites. Yes. And then after that was a period of the foreigners, the Hexos, which ruled uh, Egypt, between 18 uh, and Palestine, 18 to 16. And that was the period also when Nabi Ibrahim, 19, uh, 1900, before Christian era, Nabi Ibrahim migrated from Ur to Palestine. And then uh, Ismail and uh, Ishaq and Yaqub were born there. And then after that, uh, 16, 1550, the Egyptians invaded uh, Palestine. And then they ruled over Palestine. And then 1200, there was people from uh, East Asia, uh, East Asia, and also the Crete Island. They came and invaded Egypt and Palestine. Ramses then uh, fought against them, defeated them, and he pushed them to Gaza. And they intermingled with the people. And then after that, uh, you know, when the, the Israelites were in bondage, in Egypt, uh, Nabi Musa took them, alayhi salam, to the promised land, but they, they never entered the promised land. It was Yusha, his deputy, Yusha bin Nun, alayhi salam, who entered around 12 BC. And then briefly, there were, uh, there were the priests who ruled, the scholars who ruled, after Yusha bin Nun. And then Nabi Dawood. There is Tawalut, Nabi Dawood, King Tawalut, Nabi Dawood, Nabi Sulaiman. And then after Nabi Sulaiman, around 920 BC, uh, the state of uh, the Israelite state, which was then uh, ruled by an Islamic rule, Nabi Dawood and Nabi Sulaiman, divided into two after the death of Nabi Sulaiman. Uh, there was the Judah state and the Israel state. And then they fought against among themselves. And then Nebuchadnezzar from Iraq, Babel, came, destroyed them, and uh, sent them into, exactly. into exile, into Iraq, and some of them entered Iran. And then after that, briefly, during the, uh, before the birth of Nabi Isa, alayhi salam, they returned back. And then they were thwarted again, exiled again. And then briefly, in seven, after, uh, after Christ, or after Nabi Isa, 70 up to 132, they briefly ruled. And then they were also exiled again. exiled again. Some of them returned, but without any kind of leadership or uh, rulership position. Yes. And then uh, 
during the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, around 332 before uh, 300 years or 350 years before the birth of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Romans came and invaded Palestine. They ruled Palestine. Therefore, the Jews who used to live before the birth of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they were under the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. When Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born, still. Palestine or the greater Sham, greater Syria, was under the Roman or Byzantine Empire. And then it was Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu anhu, uh, with uh, groups of Muslims, especially the companions, uh, commanded by Abu Ubaidah, Amr ibn al-Jarrah, and Amr ibn al-As, and Khalid ibn Walid, they conquered that area era, uh, th that area, 638 Christian era. Mm -hmm. And then from 638 up to 1099, it was under Muslim rule, mm -hmm. under the caliphate. Mm -hmm. In 1099, the Crusader War, 1096, uh, the Crusader started from Europe. In 1099, they were at the doors of uh, Al-Quds. They defeated the Muslim. They ruled, they turned the Masjid al-Aqsa, the Dome of the Rock into a church with a cruci uh, crucifix. A crucifix at the top. And then uh, the Masjid al-Aqsa, Al-Qadim, the old Masjid al-Aqsa mm -hmm. was turned into the stable uh, of their houses. Mm -hmm. And then for almost 90 years, there was no single prayer in that area. In that area. Mm -hmm. The area of Masjid al-Aqsa is all the area which is surrounded by the four walls. Mm -hmm. uh, approximately 144,000 square meters. Mm. There are seven mosques inside. All that area is Masjid al-Aqsa er area. And then 1187, uh, Salahuddin came with an army. He fought against the crusaders. He defeated them at uh, the Battle of uh, Hattin, and he entered Baytul Maqdis, and also Masjid al-Aqsa uh, area, and he purified, cleansed it. And from then onward, it was an area, a mosque for prayer, till 1917. Of course, in 1897, there was uh, the first Zionist International Conference in Basel, mm -hmm. Switzerland, whereby now they decided in their resolution that they should find an, a home, and that home should be Palestine, because it, it is their promised land. Therefore, from that time onward, they started a fund for the Zionists all over the world to migrate to Palestine. Therefore, in 19, 1916, there was the famous or the infamous Sykes-Picot Treaty, yes. whereby they said as conquerors, as the allied forces between, uh, it was the, the Sykes-Picot Treaty was between agreement between uh, the Britons and France. They say as the conquerors, once they conquer the greater Syria, they divide it into two. Palestine and Jordan will be under the British uh, rule, mm -hmm. and then Syria and Lebanon will be under the French. In 19, 1915 up to 1914 up to 1917, there was the First World War. And in 1917, Field Marshal Allenby stood at the, the heart of Masjid al-Aqsa and declared today has the Crusader War come to an end. Mm -hmm. And from 1917 to 1948, Palestine was under the British rule. Wow. Yeah. Quite a very rich uh, history. No. And uh, what we see today is that uh, the same history from way back during the time of the prophets is being replayed again no. into the modern state of Israel. No. What uh, we're going to take a break and when we come back we'll want to look at the modern state of Israel and what is happening in this modern state and are we seeing the effects of historical issues or this is a modern phenomenon that is coming up right now. Viewers, we are hosting our brother Mohammed Abdallah Swale, who is also the Muslim chaplain at the University of Nairobi. And tonight we are discussing the Palestinian issue and the unilateral declaration by the state of Israel that Jerusalem will be their capital.
Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation. Welcome back uh, to our show. Tough talk tonight is looking at the issue of Palestine. Fast forward uh, Sheikh Mohammed to 1948, no. during the creation of the new state of Israel. What happens? What happens immediately after, you know, they declared it on the, on the night of 15th uh, May 1948. But before that, there were so many talks in between. And even the infamous res UN resolution 181. You know, in 1947, UN passed a resolution 181 to petition Palestine without looking at the legality of that petition. Who are the owners of the land? They didn't go back to historicity, mm. and all those factors were not taken into consideration. Since, you know, the Zionists had a hand within the British establishment. Mm. They were having a high hand, and even in 1917, 2nd November 1917, there was the Arthur Balfour Declaration. Yes. Arthur Balfour was not a Zionist, neither was he a Jew, but he was a pro-Zionist. Came by then the international, international Jewish or the World Jewish uh, Zionist Organization. The chairman was Dr. Chaim Weserman, who was very close to Arthur Balfour, the foreign secretary of Br uh, Britain. And then he made that declaration without looking at the impact, without looking at anything. He said that we look at uh, the, the, the British his uh, majesty or her majesty, the queen and the king have looked in favor to the Zionist appeal to give them a land. Therefore, deprive people with land, land, and give people without land, land. Mm -hmm. And that UN Resolution 181 simply said that, gave an, a nod to that ad, uh, uh, Balfour Declaration, mm -hmm. whereby they said we should have a land to the Zionist and a land to the Palestinian and a land which will be demarcated for the international community. It will be a no man's land. Therefore, by then in 1947, when, uh, they, when, that, when that UN passed that resolution, the Palestinians were... 70% despite the illegal immigrations and they owned 93% of the land the Zionists or the Jews were 30% they hardly owned 7% of the land the UN resolution gave 30% of people owning 7% of land 53% of the land Palestinians who owned 93% of the land were given 46% of the land. And remaining 1% was the area of Beitul Maktis. That is one uh, accounted for 1%. That was supposed to be a no man's land. Neither Palestinian nor Zionist. Well, as uh, the state of Israel was uh, being uh, declared and created, mm. uh, there came a situation whereby some of the proponents of the creation of this state thought about a two-state solution so that they could have the Zionists on one side and the Palestinians on one side. And uh, historical records do declare that the Palestinians refused this kind of arrangement. What was the reason behind this? The reason was, if we give maybe uh, an example to Kenya. Yes. If an intruder comes, immigrates here, or colonize, we were once a colony of, of Britain also. Yeah. And then uh, there was freedom fighters, they fought, and then uh, 
the Britain was removed. Mm -hmm. And then we got our independence. By then, if the Britain could have said, or British could have said, okay, you know, we have colonized you, we have ruled you for 70 years or so, we want to partition Kenya. Uh, we give 40% to Kenyans, and then 50% uh, to us, the British. What could have Kenyans thought or said? Uh, definitely they would have no. rejected this kind of arrangement. Therefore, that was the same. Mm -hmm. The arrangement, the Palestinians re totally refused that arrangement. How can immigrants who come here illegally, they, although they purchased some of the land, and some of the land was given to them by the British, but the purchase was stopped. The, the Palestinians never used to sell land after some time because in 1939, scholars all, all over the world, they congregated in Al-Quds and they gave a one declaration. It is unlawful for any Palestinian to sell land to the Zionists. Mm -hmm. The selling of the land stopped, but the British, they had, uh, even now in Kenya, there is government land. Therefore, they used to give that government, so-called government land. You know, the Britons are not, are not Palestinian. They never own any land. But mere fact, the mere fact that they were the colonialists of that area, they could, uh, they could grab land. Mm -hmm. And hence, they could dish it out to the Zionists. Well, after the Zionists had acquired this land, and yet they needed more land, yeah. then definitely it brought in the element that some force had to be used to force. acquire more land. No. So we go fast forward to the new Palestine. Already now it's been occupied by the Zionists, no. and now there's the element of force. When did this use of force start, and who started the use of force? Was it the Palestinians or was it the Zionists? The British used force initially, and they supported the Zionists. And hence, in 1929, there was the first intifada, first uprising. And the, the reason for the uprising was that, you know, the Zionists, they went, occupied the Burak Wall. You know, there are the four walls. Yes. There is the Burak Wall. The yes. Burak Wall is on the western side. Mm -hmm of uh, Masjid al-Aqsa. Mm -hmm. They went there, they occupied uh, Burak, uh, Burak Wall and said, this wall is ours. It is known as the Wailing Wall. Mm -hmm. This wall is ours. Therefore, the Palestinians arose. And uh, they tried to push the Zionists away from the wall. And uh, a fight ensued between the two groups. But the Zionists had an upper hand, although they were few, they were backed by the Britons. And then after that, there was, uh, there was the jihad of uh, Izzuddin al-Qassam, a Syrian who was expelled by the, the French in uh, Syria. He came here and he had uh, the Mujahideen to fight against the immigration of the Zionists to that area. But since they had the backing, uh, they were able to migrate. And hence there was the jihad of Izzuddin al-Qassam between 1932 to 1935 when he was martyred. And uh, he was martyred because, you know, the, the, the Britons, they use, uh, they use a method of cheating. Whereby, since some of the Palestinians were employed in the army, they kept the Palestinians in the forefront. And Izzuddin al-Qassam, Sheikh Izzuddin al-Qassam told his, uh, his, uh, his fighters not to aim at their brother, mm -hmm. the Palestinians. But it was not possible. Therefore, most of them, they lose their life. Mm -hmm. From that time onward, there was, there was fight here and there. And after the UN resolution, now it gave a leeway to the Zionists to migrate in full force. Now, in 1948, there were so many terrorist Zionist groups like the Irgun, Zwai Lumi, uh, there was the Stan Gang, gang Stan Gang. There were almost three gangs. They were having, by then, heavy ammunition. They used to go from area to area. And uh, if you can remember, in 1948, before this, the illegal state was announced in May, in April, they went to their Yasin. Their Yasin is a village 
in the environs of Al-Quds. They entered there. The Irgun people entered there. They removed the people, the poor people, Palestinian, from their houses. They gathered them in, the, in, in a field. They shot all of them, almost 200, after Fajr. And then they went round with a loudspeaker. Remember their are seen. Fear now entered into the hearts. You know, when the state, the British left hurriedly, and the Zionists with their ammunition, they announced an independent, free state, the Israel state. Uh, the world today in the media, it's awash with uh, coverage of the Palestinian crisis mm. and all the time all that we see is a lot of violence no. and the violence is being propagated by both sides no. is there a justification for this violence or uh, this violence is the kind of violence that can never end you know violence can end violence it is easy to end if people will agree to the truth and will abide to the truth and will adhere to the truth and then once everybody are there to the truth, what is the truth? The truth, this is, a, this is the Palestinian land. Well, that is out of the question no. at this point in time because no. everything points to a direction whereby the state of Israel was created and it is here to stay. So what is the way forward for Palestinians? The way forward for Palestinians is, you know, whatever has been taken by the gun, you'll only acquire it by the gun. Well, There's no other way, because if you look at uh, the history of negotiations, they will go back during the time of Yasser Arafat. In 1991, when they met in Madrid. 1993, Oslo A. 1995, Oslo B. 1996, Gaza Ariha. 19, and still negotiations are going. People, they go to the table, and after the table, it is back to normal. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even after Madrid, I think it was uh, during the time of Shimon Perez or Isaac Rabin, you know, they, if after, immediately after they agreed what they agreed, they came out to the media and say, that is just a paper. We are not going to, 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 to adhere to what we have agreed. Therefore, if you come to negotiate, uh, neg negotiating table, you agree to some issues. You know, uh, negotiation is give and take. Yes. And the Palestinians are gi have given so much. But if you say that the only way out for the Palestinians is by the use of the gun, no. how do they expect to achieve this, given that uh, Israeli today is considered as one of the most militarized states? No. It's considered to be enjoying a lot of support from many other quarters, the world superpowers no. like the Americans and all that. How do they expect to achieve this? You know, there was a myth which, which used to go around. And this myth was based on the winning of the Zionist state. You know, there was a fight between the Arabs and the Zionists in 1948. Immediately after the announcement that the Zionist state has been established, there was a war in 1954, 56, uh, the Tripartite War, uh, Israel, and then uh, Britain and uh, Russia or France, they join hands against Egypt. Then there was the Six Day War in 1967, June 1967. There, there was the Ramadan War in 1973. Then there was 1982 uh, in Lebanon, uh, Sabran Shatila, the massacre. And this winning war has given them big head that there is no army in this world which can face us. And it was known as an invisible army. But you find that in recent times, people without any kind of ammunition, people without a, without a state or a government without power were able to stand for months against the Israeli aggression. Well, we shall be taking a break. And no. uh, when we are back, 
will want to look at the issue of the Palestinian crisis. No. Is it a nationalistic question? Is it an ethnic question? Or is it a religious question? Mm -hmm. Viewers, you are watching Tough Talk, and tonight we are hosting Brother Mohammed Abdallah Saleh, who is also the Muslim chaplain at the University of Nairobi. And we are looking at the Palestinian crisis and the unilateral declaration by the State of Israel that Jerusalem will be its capital. Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation. Welcome back to the show and tonight on Tough Talk we are hosting Brother Mohammed Abdallah Saleh and the issue that we are discussing is the Palestinian crisis and the unilateral declaration by the Israeli state that Jerusalem is their capital. Brother Mohammed Abdallah. The whole issue of Palestine, no. is it a religious question, is it an ethnic question, or is it a nationalistic question? What is it? The question of Palestine is an Islamic religious question. Mm -hmm. Although most of the Muslims, especially the Arabs, they want to take it as a Palestinian nationalistic question. First and foremost, if you look into history, especially after the establishment of the Zionist state, it was the Arab question. All the other Muslims were put aback. Therefore, you find that in 1948, the armies from Egypt, from Iraq, from Jordan, from Lebanon, from Syria, they entered into Palestine. Although they are entering into Palestine was not to serve or to assist the Palestinians. In fact, uh, sometime in 2003 in a conference, there was one sheikh who was by then 73 years old, a Palestinian from Gaza. He said in 1948, he was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. The Egyptian army entered into Gaza. And they said, okay, you take your belonging for one, two days. We are going to wipe them out. And even they took ammunition from his father. Say, you don't need this one. Never to return again. Therefore, it is said that most of these armies were pro the Zionist state. Mm -hmm. And hence, most of the villages and towns which were taken by the Zionists, they were never returned back. Although Egyptian army then was very strong, the Syrian army was very strong. And in fact, one of the sheikhs was called on before the Jordanian army entered into Palestine in order to pray to the army. He was blind. He was, he was a blind sheikh. He, he stood upright in order to make the prayer, but he turned back to the desk. And he said to those big people, I wish this army is going to fight for us. I wish. He was taken high by the soldiers, never to be seen again. Therefore, in, initially, it was an Arab question. Therefore, there was ethnicity there. Mm -hmm. The question, Palestinians are Arabs, Egyptians are Arab, Jordanians are Arab. Therefore, this, we are supposed to assist our Arab brethren. Therefore, 1948, 1956, 1967, 1973, they fought. But 1978, Egypt, Egypt, the Egypt government, they left their hand by signing the Camp David Accord. They were out of question. Slowly, slowly, every, uh, every Arab country now started to let down. And then it was brought to an, an issue that this is the Palestinian question. Let the Palestinians solve their problems. And hence, most of the Arab governments, they had working relation, diplomatic relation, and they're still making new diplomatic relation with Israel, with exchanging embassies. Well, uh, 
now that you're terming it to be a Muslim question, no. what have we as Muslims outside the Arab Peninsula done towards our positive contribution to this question? You know, most of the, of the Muslims all over the world, I mentioned 1939, if you could remember, there was, there was, uh, there was a meeting in Al-Quds, which has been renamed to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. of scholars all over the world. And one of the resolution which was passed, this is an Islamic Muslim question. Muslims all over the world should join hands to make sure that Al-Quds is free again, Palestine is free again, under a Muslim rule. Well, but in 1948, when the Arabs, they, they, they left, and they, they say this is a, an Arab question, you know, naturally, uh, the other Muslims felt that they were let down. And hence, they let their hand. But this question now is coming. It's coming up. And Muslims all over the world, for those who are not able to do anything, then Palestine in their, is in their heart. And always they pray in their prayers, in their supplication, the question you find that in Kenya, in other parts, you find that sometimes kunut is made in all the prayers to pray, to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to assist our brothers and sisters who are in big problem in Palestine. Uh, as a chaplain in the university, whereby you are nurturing the spiritual growth of young people, and these being a Muslim youth, and most of them, we know that this issue is very dear to them. Yeah. What would be your advice to them as regards the Palestinian question? The Palestinian question, as regards the Palestinian question, whether they are youth in the university, Nairobi University, or any, uh, any other university, that first and foremost, we should make sure that Palestinian and to the younger generation, it doesn't go out of the heart. And you know, that is what Nuruddin Zinki was nurtured. Mm -hmm. Nuruddin Zinki is a Turk. In 1064, he left Turkey with an army to come and conquer Al Quds which by then was under the crusader. And then his son also was nurtured. He took the mantle from his father. And then his student, Salahuddin, who was a Kurd from Kurdistan, he took that flag and he was able to reconquer again Al-Quds. Therefore, first and foremost, we should put Palestine in our heart. We should put Al-Quds in, in our heart because Al-Quds, is the third holiest shrine, shrine in the universe after Mecca and Medina, after Ma uh, Masjid al-Haram and Masjid al-Nabawi. As we put Al-Quds in our hearts, no. the reality of today is such that uh, there are certain global powers no. that dictate the agenda of the world. No. You have the United Nations, no. you have the big superpowers like the Americans, you have the Russians, you have France, you have the Britons and all that. What is the way forward as regards the Palestinian question in terms of continuous engagement? Continue. One is putting Palestine in our heart. That is one. We should always, you know, they can have big ammunition. They can be the so-called superpower. But there is none who is a superpower other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, once we put first Palestine in our heart, and then it should come out by remembering them in our supplication. And you know, dua is the weapon of a Muslim. And it is not a small weapon. It is a very heavy weapon if we sincerely, if these duas and supplications are coming from our hearts, from inside us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to answer one, even if after some time. Therefore, that is second. Third, we should always, always, it should be in our, maybe in our pulpits, in our durus, in our lectures, in our talk, even if uh, five or two to five minutes, so that people always could remember that, you know, Palestine is still under the colonialist. Palestine is still not with us. 
and we should pray and then there is the economic power you know if the the arabs do not assist with their manpower with their resources with ammunition to the palestinians with uh, you know even those uh, uh, those small countries like qatar which were assisting in building settlements building houses for the palestinians have been boycotted by the arabs themselves you know the the tripartite saudi being one of them and uae and egypt they have laid sanctions and embargo on qatar because of assisting the Pal palestinian cause therefore if they are not able to to assist we have the economic power and one of the economic power is to boycott all the israeli goods which are on the shelves of our supermarkets or our shops we have that power and some of the some of the uh, items in uh, the shelves are even not essential to, to our health in fact they are uh, they are they are making our health to de deteriorate more than giving us health therefore now Everyone in the world today is talking about human rights and the need for peace no. and all that. No. Where is everybody when it comes to the Palestinian question? Why is everybody seemingly quiet about the Palestinian issue and all the human rights violations that are going on in Palestine? You know, the, 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 the media plays a vital, essential important role in our lives and if you look at the media today you can say 90 percent of the media are either directly under the zionist or is pro-zionist therefore always you know in the media if a, if a jew or a zionist is killed it is splashed all over the media media if iman who in 2003 four month old baby was gunned down you know if you look at the picture Annie, you'll not be able to to look at it Annie. a bullet from here coming out with a with a hell of flesh at the back and nothing in the media therefore this is the the major problem now these media houses which we are having is supposed now to splash uh, to splash uh, uh, the news of Palestine into the media so that because now this media is in everyone's home. Mm -hmm. Sometime one turns to Al Jazeera, sometime maybe Horizon, sometime Al Islam. Uh, we should fl splash also the news to, to show the people things they do, not, do not, they do not see in this first class media houses or stations. But even if if, if, if in our media houses we are not able to splash this news, which other media houses will splash this news? There is an ongoing circus in the so-called United Nations no. whereby the international community is very much divided about the Palestinian question. No. You have a group of countries who are pro-Palestine. You have a group of countries who are against Palestine. What is the way forward as regards this circus? Will it ever be end or will we ever continue having one UN resolution after another, which again at the end of the day, it's disregarded and never taken into consideration? You know, in the, EU, in the UN, there are two kinds of resolution. Yes. There is the resolution by the General Assembly, which is not binding. It is there, you discuss, you waste seven hours, two hours, three hours. By the end of the day, it is not binding. And then you have the Security Council resolution. And the Security Council resolution, the members of the world, there are only 15 countries. And then there are five countries, the permanent members who hold the veto. And the big guy who hold the veto is the US. And you find that if you look at the UN resolution, there are almost 150 resolution passed only, in, only pertaining to Palestine. From 181, I don't know, one, 150 resolution. Half of them were vetoed by the US. And most of the countries who are pro-Palestine are nowhere in the, in the world, either politics, economy, and so on and so forth. Therefore, they'll talk, 
uh, just like the resolution, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. they vetoed the last resolution when it was only the only one. And, uh, uh, you know, it is uh, a discredit to democracy that one country can hold hostage 200 plus countries in the world. Well, to the citizens of the world, mm. Jerusalem is dear to almost all the Abrahamic faiths no. because uh, it is a host to a very important shrine of the Muslims that is uh, uh, Baitul Maqdis. No. It is a host to the Church of the Nativity no. that is dear to the Christian community. No. And it is also a host to either it would be Mount, uh, w w what would you call it? The Mount Solomon. Mount Solo the, mm. the, the, the Mount of Solomon no. or the Wailing Wall of no. Jerusalem. No. So how can these uh, three Abrahamic faiths no. come together to have a common understanding and to make sure that through that common understanding it can emerge into peace in Palestine. This Abrahamic faith, the so-called Abrahamic faith, is a misnomer, first of all. Nabi Ibrahim had only one faith. And Allah clearly says in the Quran, if you read in chapter 3, verse 67, مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ يَهُودِيًّا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيًّا وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ You know, every, every person in the world want, want to associate with Ibrahim, especially the three major religions, uh, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Everybody want to associate with uh, Nabi Ibrahim. Nabi Ibrahim was the father to all the prophets who came after him. Especially those mentioned in the, in the noble Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since the Jews were saying, Nabi Ibrahim is ours. And also Christians were saying, Nabi Ibrahim is ours. Because uh, in that line, Nabi Isa was born. In that line, Nabi Musa was born. In that line also, Nabi Muhammad was born. The Mushrikun was saying of Makkah, was saying Nabi Ibrahim was ours. He was a polytheist. And the Jews were saying, no, 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 he's ours. And the Christians were saying it's ours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes clearly that first Nabi Ibrahim was not a Jew. Because Judaism started after Nabi Sulaiman, alayhi salam. Nabi Ibrahim was not a Christian because Christianity was founded way after Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Nabi, Is, Nabi Ibrahim was not a polytheist, although polytheism was before him, way before him. And that is why he went and broke, in Iraq, he, went, he, he broke the idols. Therefore, Nabi Ibrahim was a Muslim. He surrendered to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was humble towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these major faiths who are so associating themselves to Nabi Ibrahim, they should come and learn who Nabi Ibrahim was. And hence, then they can come together, talk, peace, and then agree on issue. Agree on facts, and then are willing to let go what is not theirs. You know, now also there's a problem in, uh, in the Jews, among the Jews. And even recently when Trump announced that Jerusalem will be the eternal capital of the Zionist state. There were Jews who objected to that. You know, there, there are people who are known as the Torah Jews. Most of these Zionists are not Jews in ethnicity. As we wind up our show, Brother Muhammad, no. quickly. Quickly. No. Do you see peace? in Palestine? Do you see peace in Jerusalem? And for the citizens of the world who love peace, what is your message to them tonight? Mm. As, the way, as, the, as the things are going in Palestine and in Al-Quds, there is no way that peace can be found. Because the people who are supposed to be in the forefront in making peace are uh, the world leaders. The, the countries which uh, have gone ahead, the developed countries like the US, Russia and so, and so on and so forth. But most of them 
have sided with one and left the other. Once people have sided with, uh, especially the transgressor against the transgressed, then it will be very difficult for peace to, to be arrived at in the near future. Well, the only way maybe peace uh, can be arrived is for the Zionists to say, okay, we have done wrong to the Palestinians. We want to coexist with the Palestinians, to tolerate with one another. Let the Palestinians, as they used to rule, let them rule and will be citizens. Well, viewers, you have heard it. Palestine has been burning for so many years since time immemorial. Palestine will continue to burn as long as people do not give the rest of the people their due rights. Palestine will continue burning as long as the truth does not come out. We all do have an obligation as Muslims, as citizens of the world, never to forget about Palestine, to always keep it in our hearts and always to work towards a peaceful, a peaceful resolution of the Palestinian question. Thank you and till next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation.